Welcome back to the Curdverse. I am Lisa Kaywood, corporate functionary by day, home cheesemaker by night. In our first episode, I talked about what makes something cheese. Basically, milk and acid minus whey, that gives us cheese. Today, I'm going to walk through the basic process of making cheese in a bit more detail. Now, this could get very technical very quickly because cheese making is actually super sciencey and it involves a whole bunch of different chemical processes. I think that the serious scientific explanation can be kind of hard to follow, especially without visual aids, and especially if you haven't thought about chemistry since high school. So I'm going to give you a fifth grade explanation just so you can begin to picture the basic process. There's a fantastic resource called cheesescience.org if you want to go deeper. It's a blog written by food scientist Pat Polofsky, and he also has a YouTube channel. I'll post links to both of those in the show notes and on the resource page of the podcast website. So the main thing to remember in everything I'm going to say in this episode is that cheese making is all about preserving a very perishable food, that is milk, to keep it for future use. So we use many of the same preservation techniques as we do with other foods. The two most important ones here are fermentation and dehydration. So let's start with the main ingredient of cheese, which of course is milk. We all know what milk is, right? Comes from a new cow or sheep or goat mom. Well, in reality, the milk that most of us are used to in the West, that comes from the supermarket in a carton, or I guess a bag if you're Canadian, is a highly processed, very carefully engineered product. On a biochemical level, it's vastly different from the milk you would get if you just went and milked an animal and drank it right away. That's what we call raw milk. So liquid milk that you get from the supermarket is engineered to hold on the shelf for a long time without separating into liquids and solids. Raw milk really just wants to be cheese. That's because raw milk is full of cultures that start fermenting the milk at their earliest opportunity. Cultures are simply microbes, germs in other words. But not all microbes make us sick. I'll say that again, not all microbes make us sick. In fact, life in the nutrient soup that is milk is an ongoing battle royale between microbes that are good for us and ones that are bad for us. The good guys use all kinds of tactics. A lot of them simply eat faster and replicate more rapidly than the bad guys, basically outcompeting them. And in the process, they generate acid that kills off some of the more acid-sensitive microbes. Some also make other types of antibacterial compounds. So all that we're really doing when we make cheese is putting a finger on the scale of that incessant intermicrobial war. So basically, we're arms dealers to the good guys. Okay, so how do we do that? And where are these microbes coming from to begin with? There are two sets of answers here, and that's because there's been a massive break in how cheese is made between the first 5,000-ish years of its existence and the last 150 years. So throughout this podcast, you'll hear me talk about how a cheese would traditionally be made and then how it's typically made today. Those of us who are home cheese makers kind of sit between the two approaches. Most of us happily make use of the miracles of early to mid 20th century chemistry, but we don't have access to a lot of the industrial techniques that commercial producers use today. Okay, so microbes. In the state of nature, they're everywhere. They're in the air, they're in the soil, they're on your skin, they're on the skin of the animals that we're milking, and therefore they're in the raw milk itself. So that's where the microbes that start the fermentation process, what we now call a starter culture, traditionally came from. Humans then augment the microbes that are already present in the raw milk by adding a concentrated solution of microbes we've already decided that we like. So that could be kefir, yogurt, buttermilk, leftover milk from a previous day, or whey from a previous batch of cheese. As I said, we're arms dealers. And that's the reason, by the way, that cheesemakers typically say cultures instead of microbes. First of all, it sounds nicer. But the other reason is that it's technically correct, which is the best kind of correct. Over the years and generations, as cheesemakers in a given region kept recycling whey containing their favorite microbe combos into new batches of cheese, they were effectively engaging in selective breeding, or culturing, of specific cheesemaking microbe packages. And then, in the late 19th and early 20th century, agricultural scientists began going around collecting favorite culture samples from various farms and then replicating them at scale in industrial labs. At first, they were only available in solution, typically milk, 
and they had to be kept at a constant cool temperature. The strength of those cultures could vary a lot depending on when they were last fed fresh milk and a bunch of other things. But by the later 20th century, a lot of these microbial strains had been isolated and chemically synthesized, and so they could be sold as stable, dried, powdered cultures. And that's what the overwhelming majority of both commercial and home cheesemakers in the West use today in order to consistently steer milk in the direction of a given type of cheese. You can think of this as the equivalent of going from sailboats where we have to work with the winds that we're given and we don't necessarily steer in a straight line to where we're going, to motorboats. Okay, now let's back up a second because I left out the other big development of the late 19th century, pasteurization. So in the 19th century, cities all over the world were becoming exceedingly dense, but there were still urban dairies because most people, especially those coming in from the country, were still accustomed to getting fresh milk. Unfortunately, the animals in these urban dairies were living in really cramped and filthy conditions, honestly, just like most of their human neighbors, and medicinal antibiotics weren't a thing yet. So the animals were frequently sick, and the people handling them probably were too, and the conditions the milk was handled in were deeply unsanitary, and it was all just generally disgusting. In fact, there were a number of tuberculosis outbreaks that were traced to these urban dairies. So pasteurization was an excellent response to this major public health problem, and it's really easy to do. Basically, to pasteurize raw milk, you simply heat the milk to a certain temperature and let it sit for a while until all the microbes, and I mean all of them, are dead. So basically, from a microbial standpoint, we've said, kill them all and let God sort them out. Now, of course, what that means is that there are no more microbial good guys to simply lend a helping hand to in making cheese happen. So in what we call blank slate cheese making, with pasteurized milk, we add more powdered cultures to the milk to compensate for naturally occurring ones that are no longer there. Oh, but wait. I mentioned in the first episode that there's more than one way to acidify your milk. One is to use microbial cultures to ferment it, like I was just talking about. But the other way is to add a strong acid to milk that's steaming hot, around 185 Fahrenheit or 85 Celsius. If you've ever scalded milk or made custard, you'll recognize that temperature range because just beyond 185F, you get curdled milk and eggs. This heat acid process is how ricotta is made, and so are many Asian cheeses like paneer. It's a chemically different process than the culture rennet process. For starters, that 185F is well beyond the temperature needed to pasteurize the milk. So we're not having any cultures ferment anything. They're all dead. Here, the high heat causes the proteins in the milk to start to shrink and come close to snapping and coming out of solution. The acid finishes the job. So you wind up with a coagulation of sorts but it's a very unstable and fragile one, unlike the cultured rennet curds. Okay, but the majority of European-style cheeses are cultured rennet cheeses, so let's assume from here on out that we're making one of those. So that means I should probably explain what rennet is. So there's this just-so story about the origins of cheese that you'll find all over the internet, and it gets keeps getting picked up and repeated in different blogs and so on, and it is almost certainly wrong. The story goes something like this. Once upon a time, thousands of years ago, a shepherd milked his animals and put the milk inside the stomach of an animal for carrying, and wandered around with it all day, and then came to open it back up to pour himself some milk at the end of the day, and lo and behold, he had cheese. In reality, the oldest cheeses we found so far, from early Bronze Age graves in Egypt and the Taklik Makan Desert in northwest China, are heat acid cheeses. They're not rennet cheeses. And in fact, they look quite a bit like the cheeses that are still made in those regions today. The earliest images that we have of cheese making and the earliest written descriptions we have of cheese making all very much look like heat acid cheeses as well. In fact, we don't really know when humans started using animal rennet. But what we do know is that probably by the Late Bronze Age, and certainly by the Iron Age, people in the Mediterranean basin were using plant rennets to coagulate their cheeses. So that can mean things like sap from a fig tree, or the juice from the stem of a certain thistle plants, or nettles, 
Those work best in high protein, high fat types of milk, like sheep milk, for example, which is also really common in the Mediterranean basin. And those particular types of rennet are actually still commonly used in many types of cheese on the Iberian Peninsula today. Okay, but it is true that most quote unquote traditional cheeses in Europe, those that have been made in the last, you know, 1,000, 1,500 years or so, mostly have traditionally used animal rennet. And it's also what the majority of home cheesemakers in the West use as well. So in a baby's stomach, there are two basic en enzymes, chymosin and pepsin. Both of them coagulate, but they act differently on different materials. So younger mammals have mostly chymosin. So like more than 90% of the acids in their stomach are chymosin, and they have very little pepsin. The chymosin helps break down liquids, specifically milk. As they mature and they start eating solid foods, that ratio shifts to the opposite. So then it's mostly pepsin with very little chymosin. By the way, if you were ever curious why your favorite antacid is called pepsid, now you know why. So naturally what you want for cheese making is mostly chymosin, as that's the best at clotting the milk and extracting the nutrients from it. Now here's the thing. It's actually really hard to make. First of all, you have to slaughter the baby before it starts eating any solid food. And then you have to salt and cure and age the stomach. And that's something that takes many months, as much as a year. And of course, how well or evenly that got cured, as it was being done by individual farmers on individual farms, could vary a lot, especially depending on different levels of humidity and so forth, what else is going on on the farm. So well into the early 20th century, animal rennet making was a pretty hit or miss process. Nowadays, it's the byproduct of large-scale slaughterhouses, and many of the producers will actually certify their rennet as being halal or kosher. But the simple fact that whether something is kosher or halal, or the fact that it involves animal slaughter at all, is a growing issue for many consumers. And so nowadays, large commercial producers of cheese tend to use something called microbial rennet. This is something that is derived from a certain type of fungus and then cultured in some type of vegetal medium, often like onion skins or things like this. So there are no animals involved at all, and so they can therefore make vegetarian cheese. All right, so we've talked about milk and cultures and rennet, and now we get to the good part, how we turn them into cheese. Ready? Here goes. We take milk. We acidify it. It starts to thicken. Depending on what kind of cheese we're making, maybe we start heating the milk up. How warm depends on what kind of cheese it's going to be. So let's talk about temperature for a minute. Now, for many thousands of years, cheese was started immediately after milking, sometimes right in the pasture. Many types of starter cultures are what we call mesophilic cultures. Meso, meaning middle, philic, loving. So they're the mama bears of the microbe world. They like things not too hot and not too cold. They're typically happiest and most active at temperatures between about 70 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 to 32 Celsius. So remember that temperature range for a minute, 70 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The average body temperature of dairy animals varies between species, but it's mostly in the 100 to 102 Fahrenheit range or 38 to 40 degrees Celsius. In other words, you can milk the animal and then just let the bucket sit undisturbed. The milk cools slightly once out of the animal to the ambient temperature of a warm spring or summer day, and it starts to ferment all on its own, using the cultures in the milk and the environment. This is still how some traditional cheeses are made in France and some other European countries. And in France, some cheese categorization schemes start with dividing cheeses into cooked and uncooked categories because traditionally, cheeses derived from mesophilic cultures never saw any added heat. But that's not how most cheeses are made today, because not just beneficial microbes grow happily in that temperature range. Harmful ones can as well. So in modern milking operations, the milk comes out of the animal and is either pasteurized on the farm and then immediately cooled to 40F or 4C or lower, or it's cooled and sent in a refrigerated truck to a larger processing facility for pasteurization, and then cooled again. And there it stays at or below 40 degrees Fahrenheit until you go to use it. So basically, unless you happen to have a dairy animal in your backyard, your first step, and also that of the commercial cheesemaker, 
is going to be to take your milk out of cold storage and heat it to the ideal temperature range for your target cheese. So that could be the mesophilic range, the 70 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, or it could be a thermophilic cheese, which uses cultures that like more heat. So they're typically happiest around 108 Fahrenheit or 42 degrees Celsius. And of course, that would be those cooked cheeses in the cooked and uncooked spectrum. Higher heat causes the proteins to shrink more and expel yet more whey. So if you're making a hard cheese or one that's going to be aged for a long time, very often it'll be a thermophilic cheese. Okay, so once we've warmed and acidified the milk for a while, we add some rennet and let the whole thing fully coagulate or solidify. This could take anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes to 45 minutes or more, depending on the type of cheese, how much rennet we use, and so on. Then we take the lid off and magically, this pot of liquid milk that you had has been transformed into a gel about the consistency of silken tofu. This gel is called the curd. So that's the fermentation part of cheese making. The rest of it is mostly about dehydration. So once we've got our curd, we take a knife and we start cutting the curd into pieces to release the liquid which is trapped inside of it, which is called the whey. If we're making a soft cheese, we cut it into big pieces, so, so there's still a fair amount of liquid left in the curd. If we're making a hard cheese, we'll cut it smaller and let more of the liquid out. Once we're done with cutting, the pot starts looking like a stew with lots of solid pieces swimming in some liquid. Then we'll let these blocks or pieces of curd sit in the warm way for a while and let the heat cook the outside walls of the curd pieces, stirring occasionally so they don't stick together. If we want a drier, harder cheese, maybe we'll turn the heat back on for a bit. As the curds cook, the proteins in the curds start to tighten and curl up, just like a piece of meat put on a hot griddle or grill. And that squeezes more whey out of the curd. So at some point, when the curds are cooked as much as we want them to be, we take them out of the pot, drain them, probably put them in some kind of mold. Maybe we'll press the mass of curds in the mold, or maybe not. Softer cheeses, which retain more of the liquid or whey, are usually unpressed. They're just left to drain for a couple of days. Or they're just pressed very lightly with one to three pounds of weight for a short period of time, maybe an hour or two. But harder cheeses that are expected to age for a while are pressed much harder and usually for much longer. So 10, 25, even 50 pounds can be used on cheeses made from between two and four gallons of milk. And for anywhere from four to eight hours, sometimes more. Then we'll add salt either by sticking the cheese in a brine solution or by sprinkling salt directly on the, onto the outside of the cheese. Or in some cases, we mix dry salt into the curds before even putting them into the mold. Now, this salt does a few different things. First, it kills off a lot of the cultures that have been busy eating the lactose in the milk and making it acidic. So that slows down the fermentation process and it keeps your cheese from getting too sour or too bitter. Salt also draws more whey out of the cheese, further helping with dehydration. And also, by creating a high salt environment, especially on the surface of the cheese, you create an environment that's unfriendly to a lot of molds, especially the kinds of molds that you don't want. Europe is a mostly temperate place compared to most other parts of the world. The Gulf Stream keeps the westernmost part relatively warm for its latitude, and it brings a lot of moisture with it. In addition, Europe is pockmarked with caves, which have this wonderful habit of maintaining a pretty consistent temperature year-round with just minor fluctuations in humidity. That magic range at which most European cheeses are aged is between 52 and 55 degrees Fahrenheit, or 11 to 13 Celsius, and 85 to 95 percent humidity. Those of you who cure meats will recognize that that is the sweet spot for your animal proteins as well. In fact, meats and cheeses are often aged together, which is why it's no accident that they also tend to end up on charcuterie platters together. So in other words, rather than preserving food through desiccation, as is typically done in drier parts of the world, or freezing, as is often done in the Arctic, Europeans took advantage of their particular climate and geology several thousand years ago to get really good at controlled rotting. 
So in case that makes you queasy, don't worry, we have a fancy French name for this process, affinage, or finishing. Affinage is the noun form of the verb finir, or to finish. We're sending our European-style cheeses to finishing school, where they develop complexity and sophistication. Now, we add salt to these cheeses because it kills the types of microbial cultures that are the most active consumers of lactose, the ones that most aggressively produce acid. Those types of cultures tend to be pretty salt sensitive, but not all microbes are. So even after salting, we still have cultures hanging out fully alive in the curd, and they still need to eat. They're sustained by the same big nutrient sources that we are, sugars, fats, proteins, I'll get into the specifics of what that ongoing eating means for the flavors of your favorite cheeses in another episode focused on affinage. But in the meantime, just know this. As the remaining microbes eat their way through the milk curd, they change the structure of the cheese and also its flavor in good, interesting, complex ways if we do things right. All right, so here we are. We've taken a highly perishable liquid and converted it into a solid that even without being refrigerated will last weeks, months, sometimes even years. If you live in the right sort of climate like ancient Egypt or the Taklik Makan Desert, it can last thousands of years. Hence the title of this episode, which is a famous quote in the cheese world. Cheese is milk's leap towards immortality. Next time we'll start talking about the different kinds of cheeses out there, the major families of cheese, and some specific types you might want to look for when you're at the cheese counter. So join me next time as we once again enter the Curdverse.